morning, everybody. I am going to go ahead and introduce the uh, panelists, and then uh, they will jump right into uh, their session. So as Scott said, our first session here is on assessing an intervention's potential benefits prior to launch of a full-scale experiment. Our framer for this particular session is Dr. Lori May of Westat. Dr. May is an economist and Westat Vice President with more than 25 years of experience in designing and conducting evaluations. She has conducted and supervised both experimental and non-experimental designs, including randomized control trials, quasi-experimental designs, before and after designs, and case control designs. Example evaluation she currently supervises includes the Food and Nutrition Services Evaluation of the Food and Security Nutrition Incentive Grant Program and the Department of Labor's Tech Hire Grants. Over the years, she's led a diverse portfolio of evaluations that range from evaluating a hepatitis B vaccine program for the CDC, a prevention initiative in a community health center setting for the Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion, the DC Cancer Plan for the DC Cancer Consortium, Colorado's Tobacco Prevention Program, the Patient-Centered Medical Home Program for Care First, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, and to assessing TRICARE for the Department of Defense. She has extensive experience in behavioral modeling, econometrics and statistical analysis, and combining quantitative analysis with qualitative analysis of information obtained through primary data collection. She's experienced in conducting primary data collection, including questionnaire design, cognitive testing, sampling plan design, and multi-mode data collection. Dr. May earned her PhD in economics from the University of Pennsylvania. After Lori sets up the session, we're going to turn it over to Annalisa Mostry, and she's going to discuss drawing from clearinghouses of evidence on what works. Dr. Mostry is a senior researcher at Mathematica. A labor economist by training, her passion is translating research evidence into practice with a focus on employment programs for people with low incomes. She has led and conducted systematic evidence reviews and clearinghouses focused around employment and training strategies for workers with low incomes, workers with disabilities, and youth, among others. These include DOL's Clearinghouse for Labor Evaluation and Research and the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation's Employment Strategies for Low-Income Adults, Evidence Review. In addition, Dr. Mastry has designed and implemented several rigorous evaluations of employment and training programs, including OPRE's Next Generation of Enhanced Employment Strategies Project, for which she's currently the Deputy Project Director. For the last six years, she's worked closely with the employment service providers at the state and local levels to assess their needs, design research-informed solutions, and build program capacity to systematically test and refine their evaluations. She holds a PhD in Economics of Education from Stanford University. After Annalisa, we'll go back to Lori, and she's going to talk about projecting impacts through QED analyses that use a similar population to which the intervention has already been applied. And then after Lori, we'll turn it over to John Martinez, um, of MDRC, where he is going to discuss assessing whether an intervention is ready for a full-scale evaluation. John Martinez, who's joined MDRC in 1997, is an expert in project incubation and startup and serves as a senior advisor to many MDRC's youth-focused projects. As director of program development, John plays a key role in new program development across MDRC's five policy areas and two centers, and oversees MDRC's grants management and funder-related functions. Prior to his current role, he served as Deputy Director of MDRC's Youth Development, Criminal Justice, and Employment Policy Area, where he focused predominantly on projects targeting young people, including young people with disabilities and those in the foster care and juvenile justice systems. John is Vice President of APAM's Policy Council and currently serves as the Chair of its Diversity Committee. He's also the former Chair of the Board of Directors of the National Youth Employment Coalition. 
Before joining MDRC, John conducted research in the Substance Abuse Treatment Center and in a community health center with patients with schizophrenia. He began his career as a food stamp eligibility worker. John holds a master's of public health degree from Columbia University. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Lori. When we look at um, evaluation, one of the first challenges that I think comes to mind is that we wanna make sure before we launch into an expensive evaluation that we're going to learn something informative from it. We wanna make sure that we fully understand um, the environment and the ramifications of the potential um, impacts. And we can learn a, a great deal from existing data. And so what we see, I think, in the last um, decade or so is that agencies have moved to um, look more at spending time and energy on pre-evaluation activities to make sure that when you finally do launch the evaluation, you're going to learn something informative. Why do we care? Well, part of it is that we, government spends almost a billion dollars on evaluation. Um, and about half of that, a little bit less than half of that's on the rigorous evaluations themselves. And the remaining share is on what I call pre-evaluation and support activities. Things like evaluability assessments, um, TA for sites, those types of activities. And, and single individual evaluation, that a large scale demo, for example, could be as much as you know, $80 million to execute. And at the end of the day, you wanna make sure that you learn something about program effectiveness um, from that investment. I think we're all very familiar with um, some of the issues that come up that are common evaluation problems. Um, program models flawed and was not foreseen to be. Um, incomplete implementation, that's a fairly common one unrealistic expectations from the beginning, um, mixed findings, some things improve, other things do not, and you end up with not having a clear metric for was it successful or not. And, and, and you may have inadequate evaluation itself where you're unable to execute your design, you have spillover effects, those kinds of uh, challenges. Two examples from history, my own personal history, the first one, um, incomplete implementation. Uh, the example is the TRICARE evaluation. It went back from the 1990s. Um, this was a time period where DOD was going from a fee-for-service world to a managed care world. TRICARE was the new managed care plan. And it was uh, brought out initially as a demo and it was um, supposed to have an HMO and a PPO component. And two years into the demonstration, the HMO had not started. And basically Congress got annoyed and said, TRICARE is going to be the plan for the Department of Defense and its beneficiaries. And they just moved forward and that was the end of the evaluation. It had no impact really. Um, and the program's never been evaluated uh, rigorously. Um, another example is actually a much more modern example, which is the mental health treatment study. It's a WESTEP uh, evaluation. The mental health treatment study was for SSA and it was for uh, individuals who were on SSDI, um, Social Security Disability Insurance, um, who had mental health uh, diagnoses. Results can be inconclusive and the example is the MHDS study which was an RCT for people who were on uh, social security disability insurance. Um, they received, those in the treatment group received um, uh, enhanced treatment for their mental health condition as well as employment supports. And what we found was that they did return to work at higher uh, rates than individuals who were in the control group but that the magnitude of the effect, even though it was statistically significant, wasn't uh, great enough for them basically to come off of um, SSDI. So they entered the labor market, but they didn't work for very many hours and they didn't earn a high enough income um, to come off of disability. 
And so in terms of potentially saving SSA any money, the program wouldn't, but that wasn't its actual original um, focus. When we look at um, how can we um, learn enough to, at the beginning to avoid some of the stumbling blocks that can exist um, in evaluation, there's several options um, that we can uh, inform a likely impact of a program. Uh, the first of which is looking at results, click forward please, looking at results of, um, from other studies. The next is um, looking at administrative and exant data um, can be very useful. The next is um, there's sometimes an option for a natural experiment or even a laboratory experiment. And the last is there are many situations where there are similar populations who face um, changes in benefits or uh, decisions that are very similar to um, the program of interest. And that although it's not a perfect natural experiment, you may be able to make inferences from their behavior um, back to the population that your program is intended for. So we have, as has been said, three presentations. Um, the first one is looking at what can be learned from clearinghouses. Um, then I'll return to talk about uh, what we can learn from looking at other populations who face similar type programs and what implications that might make for uh, offering a new program and what the effect might be. And then the last presentation um, is about uh, when do we know when a program is ready for uh, evaluation. So I'm turning it over now to Annalisa to discuss clearinghouses. All right, so good morning, everyone. My name is Annalisa Mastri, and I'm a senior researcher at Mathematica. I'm going to be presenting this morning about how researchers and others can draw from clearing houses of evidence on what works as part of this session. So let me go ahead and jump right into it. Um, this presentation is about leveraging existing research to figure out whether an intervention is likely to generate large potential benefits. I'm going to talk about the role of systematic reviews and evidence clearinghouses for employment-focused interventions, since that's sort of the focus of this forum today. Um, I'm going to start by providing a very quick background and examples, and then demonstrate kind of a more hands-on how you could use these resources to help determine an intervention's potential benefits before evaluation. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some of the considerations for using these resources. So let me skip to the end first. Um, my main conclusion is that systematic reviews and clearing houses can provide hints about which types of interventions might be expected to produce impacts and also about what has been tested and not shown to work. But they're only one piece of information, the tip of the iceberg, hence my clever photo in the side row there. Um, additional information about implementation is crucial for enhancing usefulness of employment-focused systematic reviews, in my opinion. So let me explain a little bit more about how researchers and others can go about getting this helpful information from these resources. So I'm going to start with very quick definitions and background about systematic reviews and clearinghouses. I previously had a lot more here, but I cut it down in favor of the hands-on information I'm going to provide later, which is a little more practical. Um, but before I get there, I do want to spend a moment on the definitions of systematic review and clearinghouse. Um, many people, including myself at times, use these kind of interchangeably, but they're not quite interchangeable. Um, so let's start with systematic review. Uh, the purpose of a systematic review is to sum up the best available research on a predefined research question. And this is done by synthesizing the results of several studies that examine that research question. Systematic reviews use transparent procedures, which are usually documented in advance, to find, evaluate, and synthesize the results of the relevant research. So the studies that are included in a systematic review, it's not just all the studies, they are screened for their quality using a defined rubric, and that usually results in something called like a strength of evidence rating or something to that effect. A common rating system is strong, moderate, low, or high, moderate, low, um, where strong is a well-implemented randomized controlled trial. 
moderate is a well-implemented quasi-experiment, and low is neither one of those. That's kind of a gross simplification, but you get the gist of it from, the, um, from that description. Studies are usually weighted based on their quality then when synthesizing the results or doing a formal meta-analysis, and peer review is also often a feature. So I listed one example. Um, I just went to the Cochrane website um, and found that they just published a systematic review on the effectiveness of um, plasma for people who recovered from COVID as a treatment for uh, people currently experiencing COVID. Um, Research clearinghouses are a little bit different in that they may contain the results of systematic reviews, but they often include more resources. So for example, the What Works Clearinghouse contains systematic reviews of the evidence for specific educational interventions, as well as reviews and ratings of individual studies. And it also includes practice guides aimed at teachers which draw together research evidence with practice wisdom. Um, often clearinghouses have topic areas that are fairly broadly defined, and they might include resources on kind of the entirety of the body of literature related to that topic and not just the high quality um, studies as are, are typically included in systematic reviews. And some clearinghouses also have like a pre-registration feature where researchers can pre-register their research questions and study designs. Okay, so with that terminology, here are some examples of systematic reviews and clearinghouses. Many of these, probably most notably the What Works Clearinghouse, which is what I'm showing right now, um, that's sponsored by the U.S. Department of Education. They grew out of and furthered the trend toward evidence-based policymaking in the social sciences, which really accelerated during the Bush administration. I'm just flashing a few of these up here. There are many, many more such systematic reviews and clearing houses. And in fact, there are so many that there are now clearing houses of clearing houses. So that's just to give you a sense of the scope. So now let's get into more specifics about how the employment focused systematic reviews and clearing houses can help provide these hints or clues about the types of interventions that might be expected to produce large impacts when they're evaluated. So I'm gonna talk about two. The first is the Clearinghouse for Labor Evaluation and Research or CLEAR, which is sponsored by the US Department of Labor. CLEAR covers topic areas relevant to many DOL programs, not just employment programs, although studies of employment programs currently form the bulk of the content on the site. Um, the second one I'm going to talk about is the Pathways to Work Evidence Clearinghouse or Pathways Clearinghouse. This one is a relative newcomer. It went live earlier this year, and it is focused on studies of interventions to move welfare recipients into employment and economic independence. The Pathways Clearinghouse is sponsored by the Office of Planning, Research, and Evaluation in HHS's Administration for Children and Families. So in an effort to be useful, I have included a bunch of screenshots of what it looks like to navigate the website. I was gonna do a live demo, but that was too much room for error. So um, hopefully you get the gist of how you can help, how you can use these websites um, if you want to. So CLEAR, as I mentioned, contains over a dozen topic areas. So if you were to click on this topic areas, um, you would get a drop down menu that lists a little over a dozen, I think, topic areas. Um, some of the ones that are particularly relevant for people studying employment programs are apprenticeship and work-based training, there's disability employment policy, job search assistance interventions, low-income adults, older workers, opportunity youth, there's a re-employment one, the list kind of got cut off in my screen capture, uh, re-employment, re-entry for returning citizens, and veterans. So I'm gonna do a deeper dive into one particular topic area and I just sort of randomly chose to look at opportunities for youth topic area. Um, so if you were to click on this topic area, you would get to a landing page. And the first thing you can see when you go to the, the landing page here for opportunities for youth is that there is a synthesis report available down here at the bottom. The synthesis report looks at the evidence across all of the studies that met inclusion criteria for this topic area, and it draws out key themes and considerations. It also identifies areas for future research. The synthesis reports available on CLEAR are narrative. They're not meta-analyses, but they provide really useful kind of overarching information. So for example, a couple of the conclusions from this synthesis report um, for opportunity youth are that the successful programs were very intensive. They often involved a substantial time commitment from the youth who were participating, and that many successful programs involved a job placement component or job search assistance, and there were other findings in addition. So it's very helpful sort of narrative information and assessing the literature as a whole, but it doesn't provide 
anything like an average treatment effect or quantitative summary of the evidence. Um, to get that more quantitative information, you need to do a deeper dive into the individual study reviews. So if we could scroll down on this page, you would see a list of all of the studies that were reviewed for this topic area. And if you click it on one, it would open up a study profile. This is just an excerpt from the study profile. The actual one is not much longer than this. It's only one to two pages. There's one for each study reviewed by CLEAR. Um, the profile starts with a very short bulleted highlight section, which is designed to convey the key information about the study very quickly, including its design and its findings and the evidence rating. Then below that, the profile describes the intervention that was tested, features of the study, select findings, like I've cut here to display and considerations for interpreting the findings. So for example, this particular study found that this implementation of the outreach intervention improved college enrollment and persistence, but not employment and earnings, at least for the follow-up period that was examined. The final section of the profile, which is not shown here, includes the causal evidence rating, that high, moderate, low, and an explanation of that rating. This study happened to get a high causal evidence rating because it was a well-implemented randomized controlled trial. So what I just showed you is browsing through the topic areas, but another way to get information from CLEAR is to use the search for studies filters. So if you have a more specific topic in mind, more specific population, you can go to search for studies and you can either type a term into the keyword box over here if you want to search for that, or you can just click on these various filters, whatever interests you. Um, it's kind of like shoe shopping on Zappos. Um, so the, some of the filters include the outcomes that you might be interested in, the target population, geographic setting, etc. So as an example, when you search for transitional job and filter for earnings outcomes and high causal evidence rating, this is what you get. So you get 19 studies of transitional jobs are included in this clearinghouse um, that examine earnings outcomes and had high causal evidence. So this is only the first result in the list, this displaying one through 10 of 19 results, but it gives you a sense of the type of information that it, uh, that it provides back to you. Um, it starts with a hyperlink at the top to the original study, which is very handy. <clears throat> In most cases, it goes directly to the study. In some cases, if the study is not um, publicly available or easily accessible, it provides, a, um, it opens up a new box, which is a Google uh, search for that title. Um, and then you can see the full citation, you can see the topic area it falls under, the outcomes examined, and some of these icons here, which are very quick, you know, uh, indication of whether the effects were favorable, unfavorable, mixed, or null. Um, you can't see the magnitude of the impacts from this view. Again, you would need to go into each of the study summaries for that. Um, there is an export results button at the top of this. Um, this exports the results of your search into an Excel file, which can be really handy to keep track if you wanted to go back and look up studies individually later. So in summary, for CLEAR, you can browse a wide variety of topic areas. You can also use filters to get a quick overview of the available literature, looking at a similar intervention setting, target population, etc. The emphasis is on study quality. It's not necessarily on the scope or magnitude of the impacts and Currently, there's no statistical meta-analysis. So the main takeaway is you'll need to do some further investigation. So let me move on to the Pathways Clearinghouse. Pathways is a legislatively mandated evidence clearinghouse. It builds on and enhances the work of the Employment Strategies for Low-Income Adults Evidence Review called ESER, which got folded into the Pathways Clearinghouse. The goal of this clearinghouse is to provide a systematic assessment of the effectiveness of interventions for workers with low incomes. And Pathways rates interventions, and an intervention can only receive the highest rating if two studies show significant favorable impacts. So with two clicks on the Pathways website, you can find interventions that have evidence of effectiveness on outcomes of interest. So if you click right here, find interventions that work, and then you can filter or sort by increasing earnings or whatever outcome you happen to be interested in. Um, and it provides a summary table with basic information about the outcomes that were examined and whether they had evidence of effectiveness, the direction of the impacts, the population studied, and the services provided. Um, so my, my little screenshot got a little cut off here, but there's a compare 
um, feature on the far right of the screen where you can check boxes um, and that spits out an intervention comparison table. These were just a couple of random ones that I clicked on. Um, <clears throat> but this shows you what the, the comparison table looks like. So it starts with a narrative description of the program and the populations targeted. And then down below are point estimates, summaries of the point estimates. So you can see from this table, it's a very easy, accessible way to see that short-term earnings for Jobs First uh, increased by about 2,600 some dollars per year, the long-term earnings by $837 per year. Pathways only displays results from studies that receive a moderate or high evidence rating. So we have some confidence in the study's causal validity. And then you can drill down further into each intervention or study to get more detailed tables on the point estimates and the sample sizes that were included. And notably, Pathways reports effect sizes, um, which makes comparing across interventions really handy and easy to do. So some of the similarities, they both contain reviews of studies with some information about point estimates and statistical significance. They both include reviews of hundreds of studies and systematic reviews of dozens of employment interventions. Neither one contains comprehensive information about implementation context or cost effectiveness, but I added an asterisk to that um, because Pathways recently rolled out implementation briefs, which summarize key features of an intervention's implementation, and that's features such as characteristics of the implementing organization, the population served, the service intensity or dosage, fidelity, funding and cost information if it's available in the study. And this is a great step towards addressing one of the main limitations of clearing houses, um, which I'll talk about more in a moment. Clear is also going to be rolling out some revamped implementation study reviews in the near future. So the main differences, CLEAR contains reviews of a broader class of interventions and target populations. It also includes more study designs. So I didn't go into this in depth, but Pathways reviews randomized controlled trials and comparison group quasi-experimental designs. Clear's, uh, CLEAR includes a broader class of studies, including like difference and difference analyses, instrumental variables, just a broader class of QEDs. Um, and Pathways reports point estimates for more outcomes typically, and also the effect sizes, as I noted. Okay, so let me wrap this up by pulling this back up to a higher level. And I've told you about how you could use these resources, but here are some of the considerations to keep in mind as you do that. So the first one is overall, not many interventions for low-income adults have been found to work to a degree that will make meaningful differences in people's lives. So Pathways currently includes about 161 interventions. Of those, 30 increase long-term earnings, and of those, eight increase long-term earnings by more than $2,000 per year. $2,000 per year is less than 10% of the federal poverty guideline for a family of three, which was $22,000 in 2020. However, and this is where clearing houses can be really useful potentially, those eight show indications for what could potentially be promising to strengthen, replicate, and evaluate in the future. The second issue is that implementation is lightly addressed. And I've noted this a couple of times. Implementation science and practical experience in the field suggests you can't simply take an evidence-based program and drop it into a public agency or an employment service provider and expect it to work. So the systematic reviews and clearinghouses can be helpful in identifying what might work, but not necessarily what will work, that, because that depends on many other factors. So the figure I included here with the circles is from the National Implementation Resource Network, and it shows the four factors required to achieve significant outcomes, an evidence-based practice, strategies to integrate the practice into the program environment, high quality implementation or fidelity, and an enabling context. And note that in the figure, it has multiplication between the factors, not addition. So if any of these are zero, the program will not achieve outcomes. While the systematic reviews and clearinghouses often provide some information about the evidence-based practice, the blue circle, rarely do they address the integration strategies used, the quality of the implementation, or details about the enabling context, although this is beginning to change, as I mentioned. So researchers looking to replicate or study evidence-based interventions have to be attentive to these other factors. 
And for similar reasons, it can be really difficult to interpret null effects in clearing houses. Is it the intervention itself that doesn't work or were the null effects caused by poor implementation or yet other factors such as being underpowered if, if the evaluation was underpowered? And I think there is a real danger sometimes of overlooking interventions that are theoretically sound, but perhaps were not implemented with fidelity or face challenges in their enabling context. So thinking about the 22 interventions that improve long-term earnings by less than $2,000 per year with small adjustments to the integration strategies or implementation quality, might it be possible to boost their effectiveness? It's just food for thought. So in conclusion, back where I started, systematic reviews and clearinghouses <clears throat> can provide hints at what types of programs for target populations of interest might be capable of generating large impacts, but there are many other factors to consider. And they could add value by communicating more information about the implementation context and how to integrate evidence-based practices into different environments, going beyond descriptions of the setting and including more information and analysis about implementation barriers and facilitators. So I will leave it at that. Thank you. And I look forward to hearing your feedback during the Q&A. Thanks, Annalisa. We're going to move over to Lori. This is a mouthful on this slide. It's a long title. And rather than repeating it, I'll give you the short version, which is we look at uh, as an example of how to use Exxon data to um, project the likely impact of a program. We look at uh, the VA population who are on disability to make inferences about what likely might happen to the uh, Social Security disability insurance population um, if there were changes made um, to that program. So the Social Security Administration has been exploring ways um, to help SSDI uh, recipients return to work over the last 10 years. There's been several um, demos focused on these issues, um, and they're contemplating uh, new demos going forward. Uh, we believe using Exxon data that we're able to estimate an upper bound to what the program effects are likely to be on employment and earnings, and that has a lot of implications um, for how you might craft a demo. So the issue is, oh, the question, uh, the core question is how many social security disability uh, insurance beneficiaries would work and what would they earn um, if there wasn't a disincentive for them to go back to work? And they call that the cash cliff. And the disincentive is that if you work more than what they call um, SGA, um, the substantial gainful activity that you will lose your benefits. And right now you completely lose your benefits. So you're going along as it shows in the picture, getting your earnings and your benefits. And if you go above $1,260 a month for a sustained period of time, you lose your benefits. And that's a major negative for people to go back to work unless they are able to secure a very well-paying job. And there's been some efforts in the past to look at making that a slope instead of a cliff. What we're trying to answer with the um, Exxon data is if you eliminated the um, cliff completely and you just kept the benefits going, it's something that's often referred to as the ultimate benefit, um, there would be no disincentive how many people would go back to work. It's sort of an endpoint kind of um, analysis. And what we find is that's actually the situation um, that occurs under the VA system. That under the VA system, um, people, first under SSDI, people can only work up to SGA. Under the VA system, there's no limitation on their earnings for most people who are in that program. They can work and they get their benefits um, continuing. So in some sense, it provides a crude natural experiment between the two systems. What happens when there's no loss of benefits compared to what you see under SSDI? The challenge is that the two populations are not the same. Um, you know, if we were making it an experiment that we controlled, we would um, be able to balance it better, but we have to live with uh, who the populations are. 
So our approach is we compare SSDI beneficiaries to participants who are on the VA program. And we're basically asking how much would the SSDI beneficiaries work and earn if they behaved like their near peers in the VA system. And we use propensity score weighting to balance the two groups. Our data source is um, the SIP from 2014. And the nice thing about the SIP in 2014 is it had a social security supplement. So it's a unique data set um, where they asked a great deal of questions uh, regarding uh, what benefits you had, what particular disability program you were on. You can identify both SSDI and VA um, recipients. There's uh, multiple measures of disability and functionality, and there is a tremendous amount of information on demographics. Um, we did limit our sample to people who were only on SSDI or VA disability. We removed people who were on other programs like SSI or state and private disability. That's actually a very small part of the population, um, but we wanted to keep it clean between the two groups. Um, we did find that some people on SSDI reported ridiculously high earnings that were impossible to have while on, on um, SSDI, and we removed those cases. I actually talked to Census about it. Um, it is a self-reported um, measure. It's, you know, it's done in person, but the individual is self-identifying as an SSDI recipient, and people sometimes get that wrong. Um, we did remove people who were rated as IU, as individually unemployable uh, in the VA system. And the reason we removed those people was that uh, they do face a means test. So we didn't want that um, to be in our sample. And lastly, we removed the less disabled folks in the VA who were on disability, which uh, were people who were under 70% rated um, disability. So when we look at our propensity scores, we find that they don't fully overlap. As I said, the populations are different and that there is uh, a set of people on SSDI for which they have no VA match. And there's two reasons or two primary reasons for this. One is that veterans almost all have high school degrees or above. It's been a requirement now for a long time um, to get into the services. And then the other th reason is that generally speaking, they're less disabled as a population. So we um, basically remove that lower part of the SSI um, population. It's about 23% uh, of those on SSDI who do not have a VA match. And we concentrate on those who do. Um, as a result, even after balancing, you know, it's not a perfect um, match between the populations. And I believe there are things about the VA population that make them more likely to be able to enter the workforce and get a job and, and be financially successful. Um, and so we're probably overstating what would happen to the Social Security population by using um, the comparison to the veterans. So we, we're getting an upper bound estimate. We use a two-part regression model to estimate the probability of working and earnings. We control for a full series of background characteristics. We estimate that 16% of the SSDI population in the sample would return to work if SGA limits were removed, if there was no penalty to working and that earnings would increase between about 15,500 to 22.5, um, depending on which version of the model you use. We do two estimates, one was GLM, the other is OLS, and that's what gave us our range uh, for income changes. When we apply these back to the actual population, as I said, 23% of the SSDI population doesn't even have a, a VA match. We view them as uh, they'd be unaffected by the cap removal. They're not working. They'd continue not to work. For the 6.5 million who are similar to the VA population, 
and we apply our 16% of them going back to work, that's about a million folks who we believe would go, be able to go back to work. There's about a half a million who already are working. They're not over the cap, but they are working in that population. And uh, the remaining 75, 76% would stay out of the labor force. We then looked at what was the implications at a very, very high level um, for tax uh, revenues. Would, would such a program possibly be self-funding? And we estimated uh, the tax revenues based on payroll and an approximate marginal tax rate. We know the income of, that, of the individual and their families from the SIP, so you can apply with some degree of uh, accuracy a marginal tax rate. Um, the tax revenue, depending on which estimate of uh, earnings you use, goes up by uh, 6.7 to $9.7 billion. Um, that offset, when applied to the benefits that you're having to keep on paying uh, individuals, is about 30 to 40 percent of the SSDI benefit is paid for by the enhanced tax revenues. One thing we did not consider, um, we did not consider the impact that removing the cap would have on new applicants. So that's another cost that could be um, increased if you suddenly have a lot more uh, people trying to go onto the rolls. Our conclusions are that um, the percent returning to work is modest at 16%, um, and that it's likely that this is the maximum percent that would return um, under any kind of incentive change program, um, that th this is the upper bound. And we think it's unlikely that through incentive change, you could ever devise and you can fiddle around with you know, the various uh, incentives and the implications for tax revenue. That kind of program is not going to pay for itself, given our, our estimates. But 16% is sizable in terms of the absolute number of individuals, a million um, individuals. And it does raise the question, are there other ways to encourage uh, these individuals to return to work? And um, I think that's something that SSA is wrestling with as we speak, basically. So let me turn it over now to um, John. Thank you, Lori. Really appreciate that. And, and thank you, Annalisa. It's, it's really exciting because um, um, as mentioned earlier in my talk, I'm gonna take a little bit of a step back and, and talk about some things that we think about at MDRC when we're trying to understand whether an intervention is ready for full-scale evaluation. Um, and I think both uh, Lori's comments and Annalisa's comments feed into aspects of that. It's, it's almost like we planned this, it's terrific. Um, so uh, I'm gonna be speaking from the perspective, uh, again, of the intervention itself. And um, just to note that in MDRC's nearly 50 year history, we've assessed many interventions for evaluation readiness. And my comments today are really drawn from that organizational experience. So I have to really acknowledge you know, all my colleagues in the field, um, you know, over the years that have kind of pulled this um, together. Just a little bit about MDRC. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about MDRC, but I wanted to mention a few relevant points that I think can provide, uh, perhaps provide some context for this presentation. Um, first, as I've mentioned, we've done a lot of rigorous evaluations over the year uh, in response to RFPs from the federal government on behalf of foundations, and as requested by organizations looking to increase their evidence of effectiveness. And, and again, these lessons are informed by that work after having assessed probably thousands of interventions um, across the country for, for readiness for full-scale evaluation. Um, second, um, we also develop homegrown interventions that try to address gaps in policy and practice. And, and why does that matter? Why am I mentioning that? that experience of kind of creating interventions can really help be helpful when weighing the relative importance of each of the, um, you know, of each of the factors I'm going to discuss here, um, given the context of the intervention. So that experience can also um, inform that. And then third, um, about a third of our research staff are actually not researchers. They're former program managers, program administrators, frontline staff, teachers, principals, et cetera. And again, why, does, why do we think that matters? Um, 
when assessing these factors, they can often dig into the realities that programs face having been in that role. Um, they can see through attempts to minimize challenges, but they can also see when uh, intervention might be underselling the strengths that they, that they can bring to the table. And through establishing this rapport through common experiences, it gives us a better read of um, you know, a lot of these factors that I'm gonna talk about. And that can be really invaluable in working through this process. So what are the factors <clears throat> that, I'm, uh, that I'm planning to discuss? They're listed here. Uh, some are related directly to the intervention. Some relate to the organization where the intervention is housed. Some relate to external factors. And I should also note that uh, though some of these um, may seem a little more relevant to a, uh, to a full-scale evaluation design rather than the intervention context, and I know we're gonna talk about that a little more in the afternoon, um, they all factor into decision about the ability um, of, a, of a program um, to participate in a full-scale full evaluation. Um, I also want to note that at MDRC, we don't view these factors as leading to a yes-no determination of whether an intervention is ready for full um, evaluation. Rather, we think of evaluation readiness as a spectrum where some and interventions might be readier than others. And there's a role for technical assistance that can be provided to help organizations move to the full-scale evaluation side of the spectrum. And I just wanted to note there will be a poll question at the end so that uh, folks aren't caught by surprise when that pops up. So let me go ahead and, and walk through, um, through these factors. An important aspect of assessing whether an intervention is ready, an intervention is ready for full, um, full scale evaluation is understanding whether there's a logic model that captures key aspects of the intervention. And here I should note that not every intervention that we assess is gonna be able to hand over a fully articulated logic model. It's great when that happens, does not happen all the time. But through a series of uh, carefully structured questions, you can discern whether the elements are there. For example, can uh, key program components be clearly described? Can the flow uh, by a participant through these components be described? Have, he, have key outcomes, both short-term outcomes and long-term um, outcomes that the intervention is trying to uh, improve been identified? Is there a sense of the theory of change, the how and the why these intervention components are expected to lead to the outcomes they're trying to move the needle on? And can other key contextual factors that may intersect with the model or the program to be identified? For example, are there relevant policies that exist that affect entry into the intervention for participants or completion of the intervention? Are there assumptions that have to be met in order for the intervention to be operationalized as planned? The ability to articulate these elements of a logic model can, can provide an indication that the intervention has been well thought out and provides some confidence of readiness. The absence of these factors may be a flag that the intervention is not quite ready. And a little later, I'm gonna turn back to another aspect of, of one of the elements I just mentioned, the intervention components themselves. It can help to spend some time gauging how well the target, target population for the intervention is understood. Can staff clearly describe who the intervention is intended for? Is there evidence to suggest that the intended target population is actually being recruited, enrolled, and served by the intervention? Assessing this alignment can provide clues to how well the intervention design aligns with the intended service population, as well um, as how it is being implemented. It can also help in assessing the size of the potential university eligible participants this is a good example of something that may matter more in terms of the evaluation, but helping the program understand evaluation design issues early ensures they're well looped into the overall process. And one way that um, our team at MDRC tries to understand this is through um, uh, a funnel analysis. And here I just have a really um, simple example um, and depending on the intervention and the flow through the program, the funnel analysis can get a lot more, uh, a lot more complicated. Um, through our field work, we gathered the information needed to complete this analysis, and then we can walk through the fun funnel with intervention leadership and with staff uh, to make sure we didn't miss any critical pieces and to ensure that we have a good understanding of the targeting, recruitment, enrollment, and intervention completion, the flow through the entire program. All of this can feed into an assessment of participant engagement, participant success, 
and also provide clues as to how strong the intervention is and what type of full-scale evaluation might make sense if they are determined to be ready. Now for the next two slides, I wanna focus on factors related to data. First, first I wanna focus on data collection. Well, data collection is often a role that researchers like MDRC and my peer, peers on the call today play when we're conducting full-scale evaluations of interventions. Understanding how the program intervention approaches data collection can pro provide important clues for evaluation readiness. It can also be an indicator of how well researchers will be able to analyze important intervention components like service receipt and dosage. So questions, answering questions like, does the program have a data system to collect and store data? Or are we sifting through 15 different Excel spreadsheets to understand um, you know, where, where participants are? Within that data system, are there data elements that align with the program services and with a logic model? Can the data system provide measures related to participation and dosage? Can we assess progress through the program? Are attainment of key milestones captured within the data system? Indicators that these are present suggest that the intervention may be ready for full-scale evaluation. If these are not there, it may be more difficult for them to immediately engage in the evaluation, and it will certainly be more challenging for the evaluators to collect information on important aspects of the program uh, services. And a mantra we often use with our partners who are participating in full-scale evaluation is that if it isn't in the data system, it didn't happen. And that can be kind of a, a sobering realization for programs um, who um, are participating in full-scale evaluation. Another uh, important clue is how the intervention actually uses the, the data it collects. So we have data collection and then data use. Is it collected merely to report out to funders or the board, so they're driving what the data elements are that need to be collected? Or is it used more deliberately? Is there a, a quality control function to monitor how often and how accurately data is being recorded? Do intervention delivery staff use the data to help manage their cases? Do supervisors and managers use the data for performance management? Does it feed into continuous improvement efforts to make the intervention as strong as possible and to help participants achieve their goals? Again, if present, these factors suggest a learning culture within the organization that will help support full-scale evaluation. It also speaks to efforts to make the intervention as robust as possible, which again can support a successful full-scale evaluation. Next, I wanted to turn to a factor I've mentioned a few times earlier in this presentation, but I decided to wait until now to discuss because data plays an important role um, here as well. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the data first. And that's around the intervention strength. Here, there might be some more obvious clues, like how long has the intervention been operating? Ideally, you, a new intervention would not be subject to full-scale evaluation while, you know, while it's still working through early implementation challenges and trying to kind of get its, its legs under it. But there are other things that can help us assess whether the intervention appears to be strong. Turning back to the logic model, are the service components evidence-based or evidence-informed? And here I think a lot of the comments that Annalisa shared with us can be an important resource for trying to understand um, whether you know, there is some existing evidence that, um, you know, that these, uh, these components can make a difference. Or at the very least, are they supported by well-established best practices? Is the theory, theory of change supported empirically by the exist, existing evidence? Again, uh, where these clearinghouses can be really, really important. Do intervention completion rates suggest that enro enrolled participants are actually making it through the program? And do any in-program outcomes that are measured su suggest that clients are successfully achieving the goals that the intervention is aiming for and that are spilled out, spelled out in the logic model? Assessing these factors can help you, help us and the program better understand where they sit in the spectrum of being valuable, of being um, ready for full-scale evaluation. And our hope generally when we're working with, um, you know, with programs is that the intervention is as strong as possible um, when it's being studied in a full-scale evaluation. Here also note that if possible, it's nice to have evidence of impact, um, that the program is actually making a difference for participants. This isn't always possible, since this is often why we're, we are being brought in to assess the program for full-scale evaluation. But every once in a while, you may encounter a program that does collect pro post-program outcomes 
and benchmarks those with some kind of comparison data. And this speaks to some of the comments that Lori had in her, um, in her discussion. And, you know, again, in these cases, it's really important to understand what the data is being compared to and what, what, what data that's being compared to is, using for, is being used for benchmarking to ensure that you're comparing apples to apples. Now I want to turn to two factors that I think of as a little bit more organizational, uh, internal factors, external factors, that I think can also help to assess where <clears throat> intervention is in the evaluation spectrum. First, uh, I wanted to touch on capacity. And here in our work, we assess the service delivery staff, administrators, leaders, to better understand their capacity for, for service delivery. So here we ask questions like, is there evidence that staff are actually able to provide intervention services per the logic model? Are caseload sizes consistent with what was planned? Are participants engaged and receiving the planned dosage? Are there performance metrics that help to understand how staff are doing and how they might improve? Is there evidence that management and leadership proactively solve challenges as they arrive and, and, and do they support staff? And then is there evidence of stability in staffing? How are turnover rates? If you're seeing a really high rate of staff turnover, that might provide some clues to some challenges around implementation. In, and again, is the program funding relatively stable um, for the period of time where they might be participating in uh, full-scale evaluation? You don't want sudden shocks to happen. Um, the reality is those could happen at any, any time, but if you assess those ahead of time and look for clues that can help inform just where they are um, in, um, in, uh, in terms of readiness for full-scale evaluation. And um, any challenges here, you know, could suggest that the program would really struggle at being fully evaluated, which could affect the evaluation and would suggest that providing time and support for things to stabilize might make sense. The second thing I wanted to uh, touch on that I think of as kind of like organizational and internal and external relates to stakeholder support for full-scale evaluation. In the process of meeting with key stakeholders, is there enthusiasm or at least openness to full-scale evaluation? This can be a clue that there is a, a learning culture within the organization which can help to facilitate uh, full-scale evaluation. Do other key stakeholders, such as the board, uh, key funders, referral sources for potential participants, support the idea of full-scale evaluation? And is the community aware that the intervention is moving towards full-scale evaluation? And understand what that really means. Um, we call them key stakeholders for a reason, and uh, bringing them along as we help an intervention prepare for full-scale evaluation and having uh, the support of these key st stakeholders can really lead to success. But um, So any one of these key stakeholders could also challenge or even derail full-scale evaluation efforts, even if an intervention is ready and primed. So spending the time to build the relationships with these key stakeholders and keeping them looped in throughout the process, um, we believe is time uh, well spent, it's well worth it. So that's a summary of some of the key factors that we look for when trying to determine whether an intervention is, uh, you know, um, where an intervention is in the evaluation spectrum and whether it is ready for full-scale evaluation. There's no magic formula, no checklist to say if they're, you know, these are present in this amount and intervention is re ready. Rather, it's really about doing the due diligence to collect this information and using skills and experience to make, it de make the best determination you can um, um, about where this program sits, um, you know, in the spectrum. And as I said in the beginning and wanted to reemphasize, this isn't a yes, no framework. Rather, it's about determining where an intervention is in its implementation, whether it is ready now for full-scale evaluation, and if not, what might it take to get there, to actually get to full-scale evaluation. And on that note, I just wanted to kind of flash up a tool that some colleagues of mine have been um, using um, with a program that they're, they're working with, an intervention that is looking to move towards more full-scale evaluation that really touches on many of the things that I, um, that I mentioned um, in, in my talk. And, um, uh, and that, you know, with questions that they believe need to be answered in order to move towards that, uh, that end of the continuum around more rigorous evaluation. And throughout this process, they'll provide the technical assistance to the program to be able to achieve the answers that they feel are necessary to get to that end of the spectrum. 
So hopefully uh, that provided some food for thought in terms of how we approach um, this important issue of assessing readiness for full-scale evaluation. And just to close out, I, want, I wanted to turn to a poll. Um, and, and basically in this poll, and Samantha, if you could pull the poll up, um, um, just in your experience and the work that you've been doing, do one of these factors particularly stand out as a key determinant for you of evaluation readiness from intervention? Um, you can only pick one, sorry about that. Um, but importantly, if you, don't, if you think we, I missed something or there's another factor that you think it's really important to, uh, to bring up, it would be great if you could mention that in the chat box um, just to kind of hear a little bit from, uh, from the audience. So um, go ahead and fill the poll in and, um, and uh, Samantha, I'll, I'll pop up the results in uh, just a couple of seconds. Okay, so I'm going to stop my, my share. Um, well, that's interesting. It's kind of a, a little bit of everything um, and split across the board. And I've seen some interesting um, chats pop up um, uh, in, the, in this discussion, research value, um, data integrity, which is really important. Um, full implementation and stability, um, the research value that's really interesting, how will an evaluation of the program actually add to the dev evidence base as we try and, uh, and build that evidence. So um, thank you so much. I think I'll stop there and turn it back over to uh, Lori or Patty, someone who's going to lead it through. Just, um, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And I am going to uh, first ask two questions to Annalisa. Uh, the first question is, I assume one is unlikely to find an evaluation of the precise program one is evaluating in a clearinghouse. Is there a rule of thumb to assess if the program has been evaluated is close enough to the program under investigation to be a good guide? So that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, I think the short answer is no. There is no established rule of thumb. And what the clearinghouses have tried to do is to provide enough contextual information about the features, the key components of the intervention as reported by the study authors and the context in which it was implemented, you know, the organization, the target population, et cetera, that the researcher could make that assessment on their own. Um, so as I mentioned, it's not fully comprehensive information about implementation. I mean, you would really love to see like a very detailed, here's precisely what the intervention was. Here were the key features of the interventions, the ones that, as John was mentioning, are the, the actors in your logic model that are really driving the outcomes. Most of the time that really doesn't exist. And so the clearinghouses can't report on it. So it makes it really challenging. Um, so they're trying to provide you enough information that you could maybe go dig into an implementation study that was associated with the impact evaluation and figure out whether it's close enough to your context, it's close enough to, you know, the services being offered are similar enough. Um, but the clearinghouses themselves are really not going to be able to provide that information. Okay, and then let's also have a question for you, Annalisa. Uh, can you elaborate on the point that the eight effective programs that increase annual earnings by more than $2,000 per year provide hints on what types of strategies might be effective? Aren't most programs a collection of strategies where identifying the secret sauce can be challenging? Yes, definitely. So thank you, Rob, for asking that question. Um, yeah, that was kind of what I was trying to get at near the end of the presentation is that exactly programs are a collection of strategies and you're not really sure what is the secret sauce. Is it something about the implementation context? Did they uh, have particularly effective integration strategies, et cetera? I think what I may have done was just use strategy interchangeably with program. So I, what I was sort of meaning like if you found you could take eight of these, uh, these eight effective programs and those are kind of the low hanging fruit. Like if you were going to do a demonstration, you might want to start with those and look at how they align up with what you were thinking about doing 
doing, the organization that you're working with, the, the environment, and start with those as the building blocks for developing an intervention um, because they're already shown in some form or fashion to be effective. Um, I know in the Q&A box, we have a question for Lori, but I believe Rob was maybe tailoring that to, to John. So I'll come back to that one. So let me jump into, there's a couple for John um, from Rob Olson. Let's start with, first of all, super presentation. A quick question about intervention readiness. Your discussion focuses on readiness for evaluation, but are the factors you focused on roughly the same factors that program funders should care about when deciding whether to provide financial support for scaling up the program? And if so, should the readiness factors you highlighted be interpreted as readiness for full-scale implementation, which also suggests readiness for evaluation? Great question, Rob, and, and thank you for uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, the question and the comment about the presentation. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I do think that we um, often use very similar factors um, uh, when we're working with interventions that are interested in scaling. Uh, and um, uh, in, in some cases, they're interested in scaling and continuing to build evidence as they scale. Because as you know, was meant, as Annalisa mentioned earlier, you know, we um, you know we do see sometimes, or or maybe it was Lori, we do see sometimes that you know as interventions scale, um, the evidence may not necessarily hold up because the contexts are different and, uh, um, you know, and, and the circumstances are different. And, um, in, you know, when I uh, send these, sl these slides um, to APAM, I'll include a link to uh, uh, a publication that um, we did at MDRC that was geared towards funders to think about um, scaling and how to assess readiness for scaling as um, intervention, as funders consider, um, you know, what to invest in to, to kind of scale up. So that might be a helpful resource for folks. Great. Okay. And we have one more that uh, needs to be in here. It's a comment, um, but I think it's also to John. Uh, stakeholder engagement might be a basic requirement for any type of good and meaningful evaluation, especially for learning and improvement purposes. Is the roadmap toward rigorous evaluation made at MDRC, or are there any other sources? Thanks. Great. Thanks for the question. Um, I, I just wanted to kind of underscore your point about stakeholder engagement. Um, in, in my experience, I think it is just so critical. Um, I, you know, a, a quick anecdote, I was working um, in Kansas and Missouri. I had been brought on to help advance an evaluation for uh, some early childhood education programs. And I took over for another staff member. And, um, you know, we, we um, realized we needed to bring in the community, uh, key community folks that were involved. And I think underestimated the um, lack of support for <laughs> rigorous evaluation for this particular program. And I think, you know, it, it, it forced us to kind of take a step back and re-engage the, um, the community, uh, you know, and, and get them excited about where the learning opportunities were. So it was a real lesson for me early in my career at MDRC about how critical that stakeholder um, engagement is. In terms of that tool, what I'll do is I'll, I'll loop back to the team. I know um, the team that's, that's working on this um, you know, based a lot of this on just, a, you know, spending a lot of time in the field working with um, these kinds of programs. But I also know they've, they've used the literature to kind of build some fra frameworks around, um, you know, pulling this together. So I will include some citations for, um, you know, other things that might be useful um, to reference as you're thinking about frameworks like that one. Okay, great. Um, there's one more question for you. I'm not quite sure the question there. <laughs> uh, questions for John about predicting the decline of the staff researcher. Maybe that's a one for offline. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering. You know, we, I mean, if you want to um, clarify, I, uh, yeah. maybe um, I'm reading this as you know, where's the line between you know, having an in-house researcher um, that's part of the intervention or the program versus bringing a third-party evaluator or an outside evaluation. Uh, I don't know if that's where that's going, but uh, 
I think that they work together. I think in our, in our experience, some of the you know best third party evaluations that we've been involved in have um, uh, strong uh, in program in intervention group staff that uh, you know partner with us to kind of advance the work. Um, and it's just that that partnership, that synergy, just makes things go a lot smoother. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that's how I'm going to interpret it. Great. Okay, thank you everybody. I really appreciate all the audience uh, questions here and your feedback. Um, thank you to all of our presenters. I think this was a great first session, a great way to kick off the morning.